Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody back, and uh, you've all had your coffee, and see, for you folks out in television, that's what you miss. You ought to be in here and uh, have a time of fellowship along with being fed from the Word. But again, we just appreciate so many of you writing and in words of encouragement. Every once in a while, I'll have to just tell somebody that calls, you made my day because, uh, well, we just never get any bad phone calls. We don't get any bad letters, and uh, I just praise the Lord for that because uh, everybody is uh, receiving all this with open hearts. Okay, for those of you in the studio, as well as you in television, we're in our trek through Isaiah, we are up to Isaiah 61, which of course has triggered these last couple programs, and we're going to do the same thing with this one. But for sake of anybody who may have just tuned in today for the first time, we are examining why did Jesus stop in the middle of a verse when he read in Luke chapter 4 in the synagogue in Nazareth. So we're going to go back and see where he read from in Isaiah 61. That's the verse we got here on the board, and again, be reminded that we're in book number 62 today. <clears throat> so in Isaiah 61, just for a quick reminder, this is what Jesus read, and we have it recorded in Luke 4, remember. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where he stopped, right in the middle of the verse. And of course, that's why the Jews were aghast and just stared him down. And consequently, he stood up then and said, this has been fulfilled in your ears. And he knew that the rest of those statements would not happen for another 2,000 years or more. And so that's why with his knowledge of the deity, he could do that. Now, in a little bit, we're going to come to Peter doing the same thing, but he doesn't have the wherewithal, the knowledge that Christ had to stop where he should have stopped. Peter takes it all the way to the end of the prophecy, thinking, of course, that well, my timeline isn't there now, but thinking that that timeline wasn't going to keep right on going, see? All right, so here's the whole concept of these last couple programs how that we can take prophetic scriptures and show how graphically the first part was fulfilled in his first coming, the rest has been pushed out into the future. But these people didn't know that. They were expecting all this to happen in their lifetime. And of course, we pointed that out specifically then when we taught the little Jewish epistles of James and Peter and John. There's not a word in those epistles of a long 2,000-year period of time until Christ would return. They thought it was going to happen in their lifetime. And so this is where the Lord was unique in all the other revelations of Scripture that He knew that these things could not be fulfilled until a 2,000-year period went by. All right, now in our last half-hour program then, <clears throat> we were in Joel chapter 2, so let's go back there a minute, because this is the portion that Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2, I think it is. We'll have to go and look, but anyway, let's stop, uh, start where we stopped in Joel chapter 2, <clears throat> where between verse 29 and 30, you can put your dash or break of some kind, because... 28 and 29 were fulfilled at his first advent, especially on the day of Pentecost. And then verse 31, 30, 31, and 32 are still future. They haven't been fulfilled yet. All right, so look at the graphic difference. Verse 30, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, pillar of smoke. That hasn't happened yet, but it will when the tribulation comes in. All right, now then let's jump all the way up to Zechariah. Again, where we were a little bit ago, but now in chapter 9. And Zechariah is a tremendous book of prophecy. It's just loaded. <coughs> Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. 
Now this again is so easily dissected. My, you don't have to be a rocket science to see what it's talking about. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Prophecy written and spoken years before it happened. But we know it happened. Verse 9, Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Who is he talking to? Jews, not Gentiles. This is all prophecy concerning Israel. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold thy, what? King. Thy King cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly, humble. See, that's why, who was it? Was it uh, one of the twelve that said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Why? Because it was such a humble place. There weren't any of the elite of Israel living in Nazareth. They, they headquartered in Jerusalem. So he came from humble beginnings, see, lowly, reading on, riding upon a donkey, upon a colt or the foal of a donkey, as lowly as you can get. Did it happen? Of course it did. That was the day of his triumphal entry. And it was more or less the end of his first advent. All right, now read on into verse 10. Now we jump into the next event, which would be the tribulation. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. See, that speaks of war and killing. That's the tribulation, see? And then verse, the rest of the verse. What's next? He will speak peace to the heathen. You see what I'm talking about? So clearly, Zechariah prophesies concerning his first advent, but he ties it right to the tribulation and the kingdom that would follow. And there was no idea that there would be a long time frame in between. All right, now let's just jump into the New Testament, and let's just jump all the way up to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And I use these verses quite often. So some of you may have almost begin to say, well, oh, goodness, can't he forget that he's already used these? <laughs> no, I don't forget very easily. But uh, these are so apropos for this very reason, again, of showing that Israel was looking for a king and a kingdom. All right, Luke chapter 1, and we'll jump in at verse 64. Remember the backdrop. Zacharias, the priest, had been stricken, unable to speak as soon as Elizabeth became pregnant with John the Baptist. And so for nine months he has been unable to speak. And as soon as he announced on, on writing it on a tablet that the baby's name was John, they were all amazed in verse 63. Now verse 64. This priest... Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, his mouth was opened immediately, supernaturally, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke and praised God. See? And fear came on all that dwelt round about them, and all these sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. In other words, just like any other society, rumors started going. Have you heard what ha happened to that priest up there at the temple? Man, he's been unable to speak for nine months, and as soon as the baby's born, he's got his voice. Boy, it was just topic for gossip, see? All right, and it went all through the hill country then of Judea. All right, now, verse 66, reading on. And they said, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord is with him. Now, verse 67. And his father, this priest, Zacharias, was what? filled with the Holy Spirit. This isn't something waiting for Pentecost. He has already had been filled with the Spirit. And in that Spirit power, this is what He reveals. And it's not just wishful thinking Jew. And He prophesied saying, now watch this, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, 
For he hath visited and redeemed his people. He hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his, what? Prophets. See, all the Old Testament had been foretelling this. And that we, the nation, should be saved from our enemies. Now, that isn't sin there. It's enemies. Well, who were Israel's enemies? The same Arab world that there's enemies today. No different. And that's what the hope was, that when their king would come in, they would be able to withstand all the pressure from the Arab world. And they could be saved from their enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Now, verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. What covenant? The one he made with Abraham. See? To remember the covenant that he sware to our father Abraham. And here's what it was, that he would grant unto us, the Jewish people, <clears throat> that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him, that is their Messiah, without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Well, you see, he had no idea that that kingdom was going to be interrupted. All right, now then I think I'm ready to go all the way over to the book of Acts, and I'll show you how that Peter was so ignorant of these things that he didn't have the wherewithal to stop in the middle of the prophecy like he should have because he didn't know any better. He was on the impression that this top line was going to keep unfolding. Christ had now been crucified. He'd gone back to glory. And now in would come the tribulation. Christ would return and they could have the kingdom. So in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse... 16, here is where Peter reveals the Old Testament program again. But he didn't have the wherewithal that Jesus had to stop in the right place. Okay? Verse 16, he says, Everything that you're seeing, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and the power and the miracles, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Let's see how plain that is. What's Peter saying? You have seen Joel's prophecy fulfilled on this day of Pentecost. And it went on to say, verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days. Now remember what I told you in the last program? According to Scripture, the last days began with Christ's first advent and carry all the way through the kingdom. Not as we look at them as the latter days, but the last days were according to the prophetic program. There was only going to be three years of his ministry, a, probably a short time in between, seven years of the tribulation. That's a total of ten to the second coming, and then would come the kingdom. That's all they understood. Now, lest you think I'm belaboring that point, I like to go, keep your hand in Acts, I'm going to come back in a minute, but I always like at about a time like this to go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, the little epistle. Written probably about the same time that Paul is writing his church epistles. Probably around 60, 61 A.D. And he's writing to Jews, remember. He's writing, according to verse 1, the, uh, writing to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So those were Jews who had been scattered because of Saul of Tarsus' persecution. All right, now then, chapter 1, verse 10. And this just says it all. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets, see, there again, a reference to the Old Testament writers, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. What does that mean? They ask questions that they couldn't answer. And so they inquired and searched diligently. What were they searching? All those Old Testament prophets trying to put this thing together. 
There were certain little tidbits that they could get a, a, a little bit, but nothing ever gelled. And so they searched diligently, searching what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, that is, in the prophets as they wrote, speaking in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify, when it, or he, the Holy Spirit, testified beforehand. Now here it is. The Holy Spirit was revealing in a veiled way all through the Old Testament the sufferings of Christ and the what? The glory which should follow. Now do you see that? All the Old Testament has been talking about the suffering Messiah. But on the other hand, it was also talking about his ruling and reigning over a glorious kingdom. And they couldn't put the fact together that it'd be one and the same Messiah. Some of the rabbis actually concocted the idea there would have to be two Messiahs. And they went back to the naming of, of uh, little Benjamin when Rachel was a dying. You remember that as she was breathing her last breath, she said, His name shall be Ben-Omai, which meant the son of my suffering. But Jacob overruled and said, No, his name will be Benjamin, which in the Hebrew meant the son of strength and power. So the rabbis say, Well, here's two different names. There must evidently going to be two messiahs, a suffering messiah and a ruling messiah. And they couldn't put the whole act together that it would be one and the same. That he would suffer and die, be resurrected, go back to glory, and come again. They couldn't figure it out. All right, and so when we point these things out, don't think that they were uh, especially uh, short of brain power or anything like that. No, they weren't supposed to understand. God veiled it for his own purposes. All right, so now then uh, from Acts, I think we can uh, pretty much go back now, if you uh, bear with me, we can go back to Isaiah 61 and continue on the prophecy now of what will follow after the tribulation has run its course and Christ will return and bring in this glorious earthly kingdom promised all the way up through the prophets. The suffering is past, and now the next thing is the ruling and reigning Messiah. All right, back to Isaiah 61, and uh, jump in again at verse 3. <clears throat> Isaiah 61, verse 3. Now, the next thing is to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Now we use that term even in our English vernacular. What does it mean? To have something that is as unattractive as a pile of ashes suddenly become something as beautiful as a rose in full bloom. What's the picture? When the world comes out of the horrors of the tribulation, it's going to be ashes. Now I'm thinking, is this a good time? Maybe it is. Jump up with me. Jump up with me to Jeremiah. We've used these verses at least in some of our Oklahoma classes. Jump up with me to Jeremiah, chapter 25. Now, if you've got a little imagination whatsoever, you can see that this is the ashes that's going to be the result of those seven years of wrath and vexation coming on the planet. Now, I read a lot. I think you all know that. And I'm just amazed at how many intellectual people, if they know anything of this at all, scorn it. They just ridicule it. Now, nothing bad's ever going to happen. They talk in terms of what's going to be going on four, five, six hundred years from now. Well, I got news for them. They may be intellectuals. They may have degrees. They may think they're elite. But this little old farmer knows a lot more than they do because I can go according to the book. And this is what's coming, because this is what your Bible says. All right, Jeremiah 25, dropping down to verse 
30. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 30. Now, now don't scoff at this. Don't just shrug this off and say, well, this is just some disgruntled prophet. No, this is inspired by the Spirit of God. And even though we're not going to be here, we don't have to worry about it happening to us, yet it's for us to know, to warn people that it's coming. And all I have to say, if they have any doubt, aren't they listening to the news? Aren't they reading the news? What is the uppermost thought in the nations of the world today? Weapons of mass destruction. That's all they're thinking about. It's all they're talking about. Russia has now announced that they're coming out with a greater nuclear weapon than anything else that's in the world. Well, what do they hope to do with it? Iran. They want to produce nuclear weapons. What are they going to do with them? Just as soon as somebody drops one anywhere, somebody else is going to retaliate, and it'll just be a domino effect. God isn't going to allow it to happen. He's going to do it. But it's coming. All these weapons of mass destruction are going to be used. But in God's time, all of these diseases that the world is worried about, they're coming. And all of the extraterrestrial things, it's all coming. Because God is going to make this planet ashes out of which he can bring in the beauty of his kingdom. All right, here's the ashes. Now, I've got to hurry. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord, Jehovah, Israel's God, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation, the second coming, see, when he's going to return. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation, that is, this planet. He'll give a shout as they that tread the grapes, I'll come back to this when we get into the later chapters of Isaiah, probably next month's taping. And he'll give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Not just Israel. Every human being that's still living will fall under this wrath of a righteous God. All right, verse 31. A noise shall come to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't know how you interpret that, but I think it's real simple. Nuclear bombs exploding completely around the planet. Now, you talk about a domino effect. That's what's going to happen. As soon, soon as somebody drops a nuclear on one place, somebody else is going to retaliate, and it's just going to be, well, like the book of Revelation puts it, it's just going to be like a domino effect. The cities of the world are going to disappear. That's in Revelation 17 and 18. All right, but this is the Old Testament's view. All right, going on. The noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations, plural. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. In other words, their life is going to be taken. Verse 32, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the borders of the earth. Now, what's one of the other effects of nuclear explosion? Tremendous wind. Remember when they dropped the little old atomic bombs in Japan? And they were little compared to what we got today. They were just firecrackers. And yet, what did they experience? Tremendous wind that even blew existing buildings down. That's all part of it. The heat and the fire and the wind, see? All right, so I think this is a perfect description of how it will finally come to its end. And there will be a great whirlwind raised up from the borders of the earth. Now verse 33, the slain of the Lord. Why? Because he is pouring out his wrath on Christ rejecting mankind. It isn't that he's unfair. He has given them now over 2,000 years of grace and mercy, and they still scorn it. All right? So the slain of the Lord shall be from that day from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented. There will be no funeral services. 
They won't even be gathered. The undertakers won't have to grin one iota. There won't be any to embalm. They'll not be gathered nor buried. They shall be as dung or refuse upon the ground. That's going to be the final outpouring of God's wrath on this planet. All right, come back with me now then to Isaiah 61. So the beauty will come out of the ashes. After God's wrath and judgment and total destruction will come his beautiful, glorious, earthly kingdom. All right, verse 3 again. He will bring beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness. Now, you know, Scripture refers to trees as something that's beautiful of God's creation. And they will be like the planning of the Lord, that he, the Lord, might be glorified. All right, now one more verse. And they shall build up the old waste from the destruction coming out of the tribulation will come this glorious, new, restored planet Earth. And they will raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vein village rushes. Now, what does that tell you? Israel has always been the downtrodden people of human history. They've always been the hated and the uh, persecuted. But what's going to happen here? It's going to be totally reversed. Israel will be the apple of God's eye. Israel is going to be the most blessed of any of the nations on earth. Israel is finally going to inherit all those glorious promises coming up even since Moses. And we'll look at that in our next program. What did Bro Moses prophesy? That Israel would never again be on the bottom of the totem pole. They'll be where? They'll be at the top. They will never again have to beg or borrow other nations. They're going to be the ones that will help other nations. And so all the glorious promises of Israel are still future, and they're coming. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Spelding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Spelding Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call one 800 369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.